Like in April 2014, the European Court of Justice ruled the former data retention directive in the EU invalid. Like it was a great step and signal for the strengthening of fundamental rights and privacy, but the judgment only affected the European directive, not the national laws directly. Some member states repealed their data retention legislation afterwards, but others kept the obligations already in place. They continue to save the metadata in German, and other countries even reintroduced data retention after the ruling, although the national legislation in Germany was ruled invalid by the Constitutional Court in 2010 already. The opinions on how to move on with regards to data retention differ widely. The Civil Rights Movement and Data Protection Authority mainly raise their voice against its continuation, especially in the law enforcement domain we have more demands for data retention and even wider storage times and such. We need a discussion about the necessity and the proportionality of a measure which is so sensitive for the fundamental rights, and this discussion has to be driven not by fear-mongering in the aftermath of attacks like in Paris. But the fragmentation of the legal framework on data retention across the EU member states had worried the Council, which reached out to the European Commission to ask if a new legislative initiative should be brought forward. So we can be sure that this topic will keep us busy during the next years. I'm confident that our discussion will lead us forward in this topic and I really thank for the organizers in the Belgian Privacy Commission and the CPDP to make this possible for us. A big thanks also goes to our panelists and our moderator, Diego Naranko, who will lead the discussion we will have afterwards after the speakers gave their talks and presentations. In order not to lose time, I will just like not talk too much and we will come to the first panelist. I will introduce the panelists right before their contributions. Our first speaker will be Willem de Boycolaire, who is currently the Belgian Privacy Commissioner. Before that, he worked as a lawyer and then as a chief of staff for the Belgian Minister of the Interior until 1998. was a trial court judge and counselor for the Appellate Court in Ghent, and from 2004 to March 2007 was vice president of the Belgian Commissioner on Privacy, and since 2007 he presided this commission. Mr. de Bocquelaire also advocates the creation of a privacy commission on the European level and I'm looking forward to what he has to say, how to proceed with data retention legislation on the national and EU level. So, you have the word. Thank you, Anna. Um, the Belgian Data Protection Authority has uh, the habit to organize one or two panels here on the CPDP conference. Uh, it's in Belgium, it's in Brussels, uh, so we have to, to sponsor this uh, great event. Um, we had uh, introduced two um, projects for a panel. One, the, the both were about data retention. The first was data retention, the classic one, uh, the di European Directive, um, data retention for the use of law enforcement. The second was data retention on a completely other scale, uh, but uh, I uh, would like to mention it because we just have had a tribute to Casper Bowden, and what I will now say is also a tribute to Casper Bowden. Um, we introduced also a project on data retention by private organizations, uh, companies like uh, Facebook, because uh, with the Belgium Data Protection Authority, we are in a legal struggle uh, with uh, Facebook, but it has not been accepted by the <coughs> Congress, by the, the organization. Maybe the fact that uh, one of the platinum sponsors of this convention is uh, Facebook, the company where we are in this litigation. So that being said, uh, I will explain why we think that it is extremely important that we have the opportunity to uh, discuss about data retention by law enforcement. Uh, we have been involved as Belgium Data Protection Authority a uh, lot of times, discussions on the field, uh, on, the uh, on the Working Party 29, discussions in Council of Europe, discussions on uh, even global scale, and um, we had to give also a few opinions, official opinions, because that's one of the core businesses of the Belgium Data Protection Authority, to advise, to give opinions to the legislator. 
Uh, a first opinion was on the, the, the 2nd of uh, July, 2008. It was a negative uh, opinion. You know, uh, idea, the, the project that was presented was not well balanced. Uh, there was a lack of proportionality. Proportionality is the key word. And uh, we have had a lot of discussions. We have also, after that, a lot of inquiries. And in the 1st of July, 2009, government presented a new uh, project, and then we have given a positive opinion after a lot of discussions, after a lot of assessments. And um, this positive opinion was also with some additional uh, requirements. After that, uh, the Belgium law come in, came into force in 2014, the same year of the ruling of the European Court of Justice. And uh, a year later, the Constitutional Court in Belgium had also uh, declared invalid the Belgium data protection law. I must admit that I was very surprised by this uh, judgment, by this ruling, because we thought, as the Belgium Data Protection Authority, that the Belgian law, uh, who was um, far from a copy-paste of the um, European uh, directive, uh, was much more uh, proportionate and should uh, normally stand if you uh, assess it in the field in the in the light of the ruling of the European Court of Justice. But okay, constitutional courts have to do their job and. They have done it on the 11th of June of uh, year 2015. We uh, have been confronted by uh, a new governmental uh, project, and we had to assess that on the 9th September of 2015. Um, taking into account the fact that this new proposition of law on data retention was really very uh, narrow and uh, restricted. We could, if we should be in line of the decision of 2009, do nothing else than give a positive opinion, what was the fact, with some remarks. Of course, it has been um, food for a lot of discussions in the, uh, the Data Protection Authority, the Belgium Data Protection Authority, 16 commissioners, we have to come to agree. It's not easy, uh, cert certainly not on such a, a sensitive um, project. But I will give uh, you a few elements, a few elements for the discussions <coughs> who are very important for us to give this positive opinion. The first is fair justice. Secondly, well, are we not really uh, confronted with the struggle of symbols? And thirdly, how to handle it, how to, to find a solution for this uh, discussion. And um, the first thing that I would like to say is that we are now in, a, in, in, a, uh, in, in an area of criminal justice. I, I must say that it's, it's a remark, but maybe it's important. I have worked for about 10 years as a judge in criminal cases. Uh, criminal cases mo mostly on environmental law, but also on uh, 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 organized crime. So these two types of, of uh, uh, litigations, I was confronted with the use of electronic metadata. And uh, that, I must admit, I'm a little bit um, contaminated by this experience. And uh, what was very clear to me and to a lot of our commissioners is that we are now in an area where you don't need any more um, the trial ordeal by, by God or by combat or confessions. You don't have torture. You don't have even the own conviction of the judge. You are now in an area where you need to work with facts, with hard uh, waterproof and bullet data. We need hard evidence. That's the, the key, I think, today of um, the criminal investigation and criminal justice. And if you want to investigate and you want to come to a, a result, you, have to, you need to have access to data on an efficient, quickly, you, they must be sustainable, and you have to do that in an open, 
fact-finding so that every party involved, every stakeholder in the criminal investigation uh, can uh, give his defense or can, can come into this uh, debate. If you want to, to open the, the whole question to fair justice, well, then you need to have access to and to use reliable data. Disclosure of the truth in an open and democratic debate to pursue the criminal, to catch the thief, so to say, but to defend also the weak, uh, the victim, that is also much more than uh, in uh, ancient times the, the, the task of, of the criminal justice, and after all, to restore the social order. These value, five values are the balance of justice, and this is a, a balance of different rights, of different fundamental rights, not only data protection, not only privacy. And we are now confronted with a lot of uh, discussions where you see that different uh, rights are coming into sometimes in conflict, the right to be protected, for example, the right of physical um, protection can, in, can conflict with data protection, can conflict with privacy, but you can, you can even have a conflict between data protection and privacy, as was clearly stated by uh, the European Court of Justice on the 11th of December 2014, in the uh, Czech case, uh, Frantisek Reines, for example. And the whole, the whole uh, goal for it is uh, we need to have a global governance of justice. And uh, to demonstrate that, I, I find it so fantastic, this painting in the town hall of Siena from Ambrogio Lorenzetti uh, with the... Um, the title, The Effects of the Good and the Bad Government, but I only show you the good government. It's the result um, of respect of human rights all involved. So I have to conclude. I will simply say as a second item that, in my opinion, data retention discussion has been really a struggle of symbols. Data retention has been become really a cornerstone for data uh, protection ad ad advocates. And in my opinion, that is not the whole, the whole question. The key question is whether a judge, police of justice, shall have the right to access and use electronic communication data, in, the, in this case, metadata. And I'm, I'm very surprised by the fact that everybody, practically everybody, the, the exceptions uh, are really rare, saying, of course you need the access, of course you need to use them. It's the data, stupid. And that is, when you accept that, what, what will you do then? Well, in my opinion, uh, you have to look how to organize the access and use of data for fair justice, fair trial. <coughs> and how do you do that? Well, you have to organize it uh, on, on several fields. You have to organize the collection. You have to organize cons conservation. You have to co uh, organize access, adequate preservation, and the use uh, of, the, uh, of these types of uh, data as a proof uh, in court. And if you're looking uh, deep to the uh, judgment of the court, this uh, fantastic ruling of Digital Rights Island of 8 April 2014, that is just what they are saying in the second part of the ruling. And that's also what we have tried to introduce in the opinion of the Belgium Data Protection Authority of the 9th of September of 2015. I invite you to read it. It's only available in Dutch, but also in French. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, that's also one of the, this painting, the devil is in the details. Uh, the devil is not only there to, um, to, to discuss about, we have also to try to find some peaceful uh, solutions. And I think that in the uh, application of the ruling of the European Court of Justice, and the key word there is proportionality, and I think that legislation on data protection can uh, respond to this questioning of uh, the, um, the, the, the um, okay. proportionality. So th that was three elements uh, as an introduction for further speakers and discussion, questions and answers. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your input. We continue with Jaroslav Flotarski, who works as a legal officer at the Commission in the Directorate General for Migration and Home Affairs. He 
deals with data retention and data protection measures in this Directorate General and previously he worked for the Directorate General for Economic and Financial Affairs and for more than five years he was head of complaints and legal advisor to the European Data Protection Supervisor. So he will give us maybe also an overview over the member states and I hand the word to you. Hi, good morning. Um, you know, as every Commission official, I have to start by saying that uh, what I will be saying is my private opinion, not the Commission official position. I do not have any line or something to read uh, to you or slides to uh, which would be uh, some somehow vetted and, and formal uh, Commission position. So um, what I would like to say is two things. The first uh, is about the state of play on data retention laws in member states. And the second, uh, a few thoughts, <coughs> sorry, it's about the perspectives for EU law in this area. So whether we would have or not some EU law instrument or, or other actions uh, in relation to member states legislation on data retention. So the first point, uh, situation in the member states, state of play <coughs> of data retention legislation. Um, <coughs> that is not so easy to establish because, um, well, um, Member states are not communicating to the Commission what they do in, in, uh, in, uh, in the area of data retention or mass surveillance. It's sometimes even difficult to understand whether a piece of legislation is really data retention or it's more than data retention. It's, it's something, uh, 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 well, definition of data retention is not very, very obvious in, in every case. And as we do not have the directive, there is not something like transposition of the directive anymore. So we rely on information from the member states. Eurojust did a lot of work also in the, in the, in the area of data retention. They, um, uh, and th they did a questionnaire and, and get some... Excuse me, we don't hear you in the back. Oh, sorry. Um, and got some interesting replies. And we also have data protection authorities, which provides uh, information. And Article 29 Working Party also started to uh, uh, work on some sort of comprehensive state of play of data retention member states. So what this data retention legislation is today? Well, uh, what is certain that in 11 member states, uh, the data retention legislation was somehow cancelled, invalidated, abolished uh, uh, by the courts, in the majority of cases by constitutional courts, but in some member states by lower courts. In 11 other member states, that data retention legislation was recently, recently means after the judgment of the uh, invalidating the data retention directive on the 8th of April last year, uh, two years ago, 2014. So in 11 member states, uh, the, the, um, the legislator uh, modified the law. So in the majority of cases, that modification went in the direction of, let's say, more guarantees for the privacy. But we have, <coughs> excuse me, examples of member states where that was the opposite direction, so less privacy, more security, let's say that way. Um, so um, the bottom line is that today it seems that we do have legislation, valid legislation in 22 member states. And in six member states there is no legislation on data retention. Um, that again can be debated what does it mean but uh, that seems to be the case 22 do have legislation six do not have the legislation um, in my knowledge in um, five of those six member states which do not have the legislation they do work on the legislation and they are on different stages of uh, either thinking or adopting or drafting the legislation in only one member states again in my knowledge maybe it's not correct anymore um, the government or the legislator is doing nothing uh, on, on, in, in, that, uh, in that area. Um, so the picture is extremely fragmented. We have very fragmented legislation since the cancellation of the directive. Uh, the national legislation is going in opposite directions. Uh, so in some cases no legislation, in some cases legislation which is more stricter than before under the directive, in some other cases more guarantees for privacy but, but legislation. Uh, so there are different scopes in different member states of the, the legislation on data retention, so different data are collected, different retention periods um, uh, varying from four weeks to two years, 
um, different guarantees and safeguards for, for data protections, different levels of access to data also. So sometimes authorizations by judges, in some other cases by prosecutors, in some other cases the law enforcement authorities can directly uh, request the data without uh, judicial authorizations, and also purposes of access vary hugely from one member state to another. It can be very serious crime, less serious crime, any crime, uh, depending on the member states. So very, very fragmented picture we, we have now. Um, when we look at the member states, what we see that the member states authorities, and I mean political authorities, but also judiciary, member states, courts have different understandings of the ruling of the Court of Justice in validating the Data Retention Directive. And for some authorities, um, data retention is um, not compatible with the EU law as such, so the bulk indiscriminate collection it's not compatible. This is rather a uh, rare approach, but it, it happens that we do have uh, such approaches by some member states. In other member states, the data retention is lawful under EU law, that's how they read the ruling of the EU court, but uh, there should be some guarantees. And what those guarantees should be, it's again a, a totally fragmented picture. Um, again, to my knowledge, today every member state, at least officially, formally, when you listen to member states in the council meetings, they all acknowledge the usefulness of data retention. There is no member state saying this is useless, it shouldn't be done. Um, only one member state considers that it may be it's illegal or politically too difficult, so they do not try apparently to uh, introduce data retention legislation. But, but they also share the, the view that it, is, it would be useful to have it. Uh, so there is a very widespread consensus on the utility and, and usefulness of data retention, and that is, um, and that is visible when, when, when we see the positions of member states. Um, now I think the time is going on, so the second point, perspectives on EU law on data retention. Uh, the position of the Commission, I think it's rather clear, the Commission is not proposing any instrument and not working on any instrument on data retention. If you want the formal position of the Commission, I think the most recent one is the press release uh, Commission released on 16th of September last year, 2015, in the uh, context of the debate in Germany on German data retention law. The Commission said that we do not advocate for data retention, we do not prohibit data retention, it's left to member mm -hmm. states and the member states can legislate on data retention as, as they wish, uh, as far as they respect EU law. And that position is still valid. So Commission is not preparing, is not investigating, is not drafting impact assessment or consulting whatsoever on data retention legislation right now. And it's not planned. Um, the Council and the Parliament, again, to my knowledge, there is no clear position. It's, it's not uh, exact that the Council called the Commission to uh, propose an instrument. The Council discussed uh, uh, that issue uh, in the last Justice and Home Affairs meeting in December, on the 3rd of December, but the conclusion of this discussion was not to call the Commission to propose an instrument. So the Dutch Presidency of the Council now is continuing reflection on the future of data retention at EU level. So we the Council is still discussing and reflecting and Member States um, didn't call the Commission for action. Um, so the position of the member states, you can imagine, it's rather complex. Uh, they are member states in favor of an EU instrument, EU-wide instrument. They are member states against EU-wide instrument for different reasons in both groups. Uh, that is very complex and shared picture of, of positions. Some positions are also shifting, so it's rather dynamic. And recent events, of course, in Paris contributes to, to shifts in both directions. Um, that's about the, 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 the situation right now, but two observations about EU law um, involvement in data retention legislation. The first one is that I think there is an understanding um, across the EU institutions that 
the, the judgment of the Court <coughs> of Justice uh, left some important question marks. The, judgments, uh, the judgment um, uh, cancelling data retention uh, directive, especially as to compatibility of the national legislation with EU law. Um, so we all wait for uh, the future case law, which is a uh, teletusferia case, which we expect this year, somehow maybe after the summer break. Um, and there is a new case which was uh, registered by the court, I believe, on 28th or 29th of December. It's the British case introduced by the British High Court of Justice. Um, and it's um, Davis and others case, uh, which also relates to data retention legislation. Uh, so we do wait at least for the teletosphere case and, 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 and before that case is delivered, probably nothing will uh, really move on EU level due to this legal uncertainty on how to interpret the, the, the judgment on, a, on a cancellation of data retention directive. Another observation, um, which is equally important, um, data retention, you know, it's a strange thing because <laughs> data retention legally, it's very much um, related to dilemma or debate what to do with article 4 paragraph 2 of the EU treaty which says that the national security is uh, the sole responsibility of the member states as data retention <coughs> measures are enacted by for the purpose of national security or security or law enforcement or prosecution of crimes where we are on the, on the shaky ground, which is politically shaky and legally shaky. So when the EU institutions wants to intervene in this area, we immediately get um, voices uh, claiming that we are uh, overstepping over exclusive competence or we are out of the scope of the EU law. So we know the data retention is not out of the scope of the EU law because we had the data retention directive and the, 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 the legal base was validated by the court in the case Ireland against uh, Parliament and Council uh, some years ago. Um, but we have in the, um, in the member states um, laws where it is not um, very clear whether it's still data retention or it's something different, like mass surveillance, um, which is not data retention anymore. So again, if you look at the writings of the Commission, you will not find, at least I never found, maybe someone, if someone found, please tell me, uh, how we define this national security and wh what we do with Article 4.2. Um, that is may be possible to find out reading um, replies of commissioners to parliamentary questions. But what you can deduce from that is that uh, th the basic line is when we ask private telecom, internet providers, etc., uh, to retain data and then they can be accessed by law enforcement, etc., that is data retention that is within the scope of EU law and that we can legislate on that. But when the intelligence or security or law enforcement services directly tape the data, so they, they register them, they do not ask the provider to register, but they register and they keep them, that is outside the scope of the EU law. So I don't know if that is right interpretation or not, but that is uh, a thinking, I think, which is dominant uh, in Brussels. But that, of course, has consequences on uh, any future involvement of EU law in this area. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank Our you. third speaker will be Fanny Hidvegi. She's an international privacy fellow at EPIC. And after she graduated from law school, went worked at the consumer protection section of the Hungarian Competition Authority and later in a law firm which was specialized in the field of unfair commercial practices. Here she will be in another role because she worked as the head of the Data Protection and Freedom of Information program of the Hungarian Civil Liberties Union and from 2012 to 2015 she has led the fight against the national data retention law in, in Hungary. So, yep, looking much. forward. Good morning everyone. Um, I'm, I'm very glad to be back after uh, last year's uh, discussion on data retention. And in this panel 
I represent civil society and one civil society organization that was part of this fight. And uh, m my narrative for to more to, to this morning um, was inspired by yesterday when we talked at the privacy camp about strategic litigation and uh, how civil society pursues strategic litigation. And there was one issue that we did not cover and that was success or how we measure success or failure. And I think data retention is a perfect case to talk about that. And uh, um, this is what I'd like to show you. We have a timeline on our website, but I don't think it's accessible now, but I can, I can circulate that. Um, so what happened in Hungary is, uh, is a decade long fight. And um, spoiler alert, we're not very far. And um, I'd like to tell you this story. The only background information that you need to know is that Hungary is not a democratic country anymore in our uh, views. And um, since uh, 2010, there were really important changes in the legal instruments that a human rights uh, a lawyer can actually use. We filed a constitutional complaint with the Constitutional Court back in 2007, and that was very important because it was the instrument of actio popularis, which is, you know, the abstract challenge of a law if it's constitutional or not. But the current government diminished this uh, possibility in 2011, and as a consequence, the Constitutional Court dismissed every given actio popularis on their desk. So for a couple of years, we felt really sad and we worked on other issues and then the European Court of Justice um, decision happened. And it gave us new energy and instruments and ideas to how, to, how to continue. Because of the uh, absence of actio popularis, it was perfectly clear that we need an individual concrete case and uh, what we had to do is to actually file a lawsuit against someone to go through all the steps of uh, ordinary and extraordinary appeals and finally uh, reach the constitutional court maybe after like four years or something. That was our prediction. After many, many negotiations, we chose Telenor as an ally or as a target. It depends on how you want to frame it. They were not very happy to being sued, of course, from a public relations perspective, but they totally refused the idea of data retention. And why we chose them is that we wanted to have an ally whenever we have to turn to the constitutional court. We wanted them to file with us the same complaint and have a judgment on data retention. Therefore, uh, after the judgment, we filed a request on behalf of a client uh, to Telenor, and we asked two things. First, to give us information on the personal data on the client, what they actually stored. And second, more importantly, to delete it. Of course, they refused the deletion because the national data retention law is, was and is applicable. And as a consequence, we had the right to file a lawsuit against Telenor before the ordinary courts. And uh, this is what we did. And the most important part of that claim was we also requested the judge to refer the case directly to the constitutional court. That's the only way where you can circumvent the whole procedure of going through every step. The judge can decide to refer the case directly to the constitutional <coughs> court if she believes that the applicable law is unconstitutional. And to our very, very big surprise, the judge accepted this request and referred the case to the constitutional court one and a half year ago. The best part of this that in this case, the court has 90 days, the constitutional court has 90 days to make a judgment. And it's a big, big difference because if it was a normal constitutional complaint, the court doesn't have any deadlines at all, <coughs> ever. Um, and I think, so this was a huge success. I, and especially in a country where I said we don't trust uh, 
institutions anymore, not even the constitutional court, not to mention the data protection authority, but that's a whole different story in Hungary. And uh, I think Hungary was the only country, but maybe you can correct me if that's not wrong, when the court, where the case, data retention case, actually reached the constitutional court, and the court decided not to strike down data retention. So as you can imagine, it was a big failure after all that many years. After the co Constitutional Court's refusal to strike it down, which was not on the merits, but on, the on some very stupid procedural grounds, the case went back to the ordinary judge. We lost on the first instance because you know it was still applicable, uh, the law, but they gave us the information and now we appealed the case. And the second, the second, so the Court of Appeal hearing will be in April 2016, exactly two years after uh, the judgment of the EU court. Uh, that's the very, very brief outline of the case. And uh, what I'd like to make the points to you that how, how difficult it is in domestic strategic litigation to choose your target wisely and uh, you mentioned the EU, EU law and domestic law at the same time. I think it was very important to combine the two and we used the EU development as a leverage both on the communication side and on the legal side. And uh, we also had very, very important supporters before the Constitutional Court from Privacy International, Open Rights Groups, and a group of scholars led by Christina Irion and the University of Amsterdam. They argued for the Constitutional Court to decide the case on, the, on EU merits because the court actually has the right to say that it's unconstitutional because it uh, violates international commitments and laws. And the Constitutional Court didn't even address that issue. They, they uh, pretended that this request never happened. So we are really looking forward uh, about how, how the compatibility with EU law will turn out in the, in the later cases. Um, so I leave it, leave it upon you to decide whether it's a failure or a success. But uh, since 2010 in Hungary, um, but now we can see it's in Poland as well, it's very hard to define success for human rights litigators. And uh, we had to reinterpret this word. And it's very important for donors as well to understand how success changed in recent years. And so what we see on the EU level, unfortunately, I'm not very optimistic. And I advise you to think through what's going to happen in the upcoming years and how we can talk about success or failure in the future. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Our last speaker will be Philippe van Limpoot, and he works like on a daily basis with internet and information security related cases as an investigating judge. He also treats terrorism cases as a specialized judge and is assigned as an expert of the Belgian delegation in the Convention Committee on Cybercrime of the Council of Europe. He's also a lecturer at the Catholic University of Leuven at the Institute of Criminal Law. So, Thank you very much, uh, Anna. Uh, can everybody hear me in the back? Don't be afraid. <laughs> I'm representing the law enforcement, but I'm a judge, so I will uh, be very careful uh, to what I say. What I say is also my personal opinion. Uh, if you might hear me say that some judgments are really crazy, then that is very much my personal opinion but I invite you to, to think with me about uh, the slides I'm <coughs> going to, to show you. Can I have the, the pointer? Thank you very much. Um, to my ID, ladies and gentlemen, um, we are in a very strange period. Um, one of the people I met in the, when I was registering, they said, oh, you're representing law enforcement. Do you feel at ease? Uh, admits all those people who are representing data protection and people who represent privacy rights. And I said, of course, I'm a judge. It's my job to protect privacy and to see into it that data retention is, is not abused. But for the moment, I don't think we have uh, an honest uh, battle about 
some of the rights. There are more than one fundamental right in, in, in our uh, society. And to say it with a picture, I really feel cornered for the moment. I don't think we have an honest discussion. I'm law practitioner. I excuse myself. I apologize. I see real victims. I see real cases. And I see the impossibility to solve cases nowadays. Uh, as Anna said, I'm a terrorism judge. Um, we are in very busy days. And what I see is that one, once we are confronted with, for example, data retention not being available, that still the case doesn't go away. And that for judges being able to find the truth, that they have to search for other measures. And those other measures are, in most cases, more coercive measures like search warrants, like depending on informants, uh, witnesses, people who testify to the police but do not want to be known. So we, we see a shift from things that are available, that are concrete and solid proof, like Mr. de Beukelaar said, to other things to solve cases. And I don't think that's a, a very good idea. And in the discussions we already had, I, I, I think Professor uh, De Hert just left, but uh, it's a brilliant professor. But when I sit at the table with uh, professors and with people from private sector, they say, but Mr. Investigating Judge, do not cry. You are the most powerful man in the world. You still have a lot of things you can do. And I have to be honest, that's not true. It's not true. I, have, I am confronted with all those platinum sponsors and premier sponsors who are private companies and are, who are also used their services by my suspects. And that's not always easy. This is a, a very important man who showed us that things are really getting uh, to a point that we have to worry about data and that we have to worry about who is accessing the data. Um, but what this man showed, um, people are abusing to put it all together uh, in on the same pile. Um, I do not want to live in 1984 George Orwell uh, police controlled state where Big Brother is watching me and watching my contacts and watching what I am doing every day. Um, that's why I am a judge and why I have to look into it that data is not abused. But please, can we be honest? There is a lot of difference between the first piler secret agencies. The Belgian government was hacked by foreign secret services. They have a lot of data to their possession. And Mr. Snowden showed us what backdoors can do and how data is available. Am I NSA? No. Am I secret service? No. We're talking about real cases, cases where we have victims and we are to, where we try to solve the case. Second pillar, private companies. Oh, it's so nice to have a free access to Facebook, Gmail, uh, Maps, Google Maps, and every civilian uses those services and shares data, puts data on the web, and they don't care. So those companies have a lot of information about who we are, what we do. They have a lot of information. Do they share this information with law enforcement? No. Uh, we had the Yahoo ruling in Belgium. Yahoo said, we do not collaborate with law enforcement. Please come to the United States and ask it very politely, and then we will say no, even to identify people. And may I remind you, data retention, we do not talk about content of conversations. We only talk about who is who on the internet, who used which service. And the third pillar, that's me. That's a small one. I'm the investigating judge called in a case to look for a girl that disappeared, called in a case where uh, a terrorist attack uh, is supposed to happen because we have a terrorist threat and where I look for information and to try to solve cases, not only in disfavor of the suspect, but also in favor of the suspect. In French, it's called a charge et à décharge. That means that as a judge, I have to find the truth. That means the things that are good and the things that are bad. And what is the remarkable difference between those three services? That when I need that data, data retention, that you can always come and look what I do with that data. 
because the defense lawyer, the lawyer of the, of the victim, the judge who is going to judge the case at the end of the trial, is going to see how, what data did you obtain? How did you obtain that data? Where are you using it for? And if there is a discussion where they say, it wasn't the judge who allowed police to take that data, so this data is invalid, then there will be penalties. In Belgium, we have a, a system, we had a system, where the penalty side, uh, because Mr. Beukler didn't speak about the penalty side, but penalty side is also very important. What do we do with people who abuse data? It's very important, because if you want to keep data, you also have to put something in place that you can assure that people won't abuse it. Now, talking about those private companies, it, it's, it's for me, it's a, a really frustrating thing. It's one, one of the slides, it's only the, from the 24th of January. You have the, all those private companies who say, don't trust your government, do not trust your government. Do not trust the Constitutional Court. Do not trust your privacy commission. We are the private companies. We assure your privacy. This is one of the, of the latest uh, informations we got. Uh, for us, it's impossible to wiretap communication between two, two Apple accounts. When you send your messages on, a, on an uh, iPhone, I'm not able to wiretap them because they are encrypted. So you're safe. And you're not safe because what we discovered is that Apple backs it up in the iCloud, even when it was encrypted, because they back up at each side of, of the communication system. So Apple has your information. Now you feel much safer, because you trust that American-based company, and they're not going to abuse your conversations. What we see after the terrorist attacks in Paris is that Facebook is a little bit afraid, and that they are now dumping information of their customers towards law enforcement. They say, take it. We do not want to be responsible. And it is really upsetting because what we see is that even messages that were erased, messages that, that, that are from long, long, long ago, that Facebook still has them. They keep them for you. You don't know that they are there, but they still keep them for you. So for me, this is a problem. I am a judge. And I'm really, really, really much in favor of privacy rights. I do not want you to know what I did yesterday. I don't want to know what you did last yesterday. But if something bad happens, me as a judge, I want to be able to look for the truth. Because there are not only privacy rights, there are also other rights, the right of life. If we have like a terrorist attack, I want to know who is behind it. I do not want to go from the idea that it's probably IS. No, I want to know which person is responsible for what happened. Fair trial. Do we use data also in favor of suspects? Yes, of course. When we have two witnesses saying, ah, it was a guy with uh, glasses, a very intellectual looking guy, it might be that police is standing at your door you're not supposed to prove your innocence, but sometimes witnesses can point towards a certain person. That data that we collect is also used by judges to prove the innocence of somebody. You don't have to prove your own innocence, but if everybody is pointing at you, it's nice that you are able to say, but it, it can't be me because I was at the coast at that time, I was working, and I, and I know I texted a lot and I sent some papers to my boss. So we have digital evidence traces that I was not at the crime scene, I look for the truth. If you make me looking or solving cases with my both hands tied to my back, I'm, go I'm going to find a kind of a truth, a judicial truth. That means what the judge thinks has happened. That doesn't interest me because in a fair society, I am looking for the truth. I really want to know what happened in favor and sometimes against the suspect who I'm, I'm prosecuting or investigating the case. So when I read uh, the judgments that were made by Luxembourg and by our Belgian Constitutional Court, and when I read the advice that the Prosecutor General gave towards the, the Luxembourg Court, I think there is a very big difference between keeping the data versus accessing the data. If you do not keep the data, you're not going to solve cases. 
Um, I only have three minutes left, so I invite you to look at the end of my slides. It will be available. I have seven concrete cases for you to solve without any data retention. If you are able to solve them without any data retention, please call me. I will give you my number because then you will be appointed as expert to the Belgian government directly. I need data to solve cases. And when I read the judgment, I sometimes think, and I, I apologize for my prov provoking words, I read sentences that I do not understand. A uh, higher court that talks about you should be able to narrow down the data and say from whom you're going to collect data, from which period of time you're going to collect data, from which geographical zone you are collecting data. And this was cut and pasted by our constitutional court. Motivation of one page to annul a legislation that was okayed by the Privacy Commission. And I say to you, do they even understand where they are writing about? You want me to narrow down the data of people that are interesting for me. Wh which data? Which people should we collect data from? Muslim people? Only Muslim people we collect data from. Normally in the audience there is somebody like, oh, oh, sir, now you're discriminating. Okay. We will only collect the data of people living in Charleroi in Belgium because a lot of the burglars come from Charleroi. <coughs> Sorry, sir, we already also had burglars from Brussels. People, I, Ali, I do not understand what they are talking about. I also went to uh, law school. Uh, I have a, a special degree. But if you write this to annul data retention, I do not think that you know how law enforcement works. And to, to end my, uh, my expose, this was the internet in 1972. <coughs> this is a little bit the internet, what we have nowadays. I am confronted in every other case, and still I have to convince some people from the European Commission or the European Parliament. A guy came to my <laughs> office and asked me, can you please show a case where you need data in? I said, pick any case. Uh, my customers, my suspects, use it to communicate, to commit crimes, to facilitate crimes. And there is no case where I do not need that data. Um, this is my conclusion. And uh, the, um, the concrete cases you can read yourself. This is a terrorist attack, Belgium. The only trace we found, because people used the, the TOR system, uh, something that was installed for ex freedom of expression, but also terrorists and criminals use TOR. So we had a lot of traces to different countries, but the, gu the guy made one mistake. He left uh, the Gmail account in which he created his uh, first uh, account. And it was created with an IP address, and it was created in 2011. And what we looked up is that we found out that it was somebody from Belgium, and we said, yes, we got a terrorist. No, because we threw away the data. And to me, that's a problem. How long are we going to collect data? Parliament discuss about it. We have statistics showing which cases we can solve and which cases we are not able to solve according to how long we keep data. But this, this really upsets me because this is concrete, solid proof, bulletproof uh, proof that you can use in front of court. Uh, and this is the last slide. The Yahoo people, I don't know if they are a sponsor. Yahoo says, we do not collaborate with the Belgian government, but we are very friendly people. Come and ask us to identify people. Just write us a letter. I am when I am provoked, I always react. So I did so. And I asked to, identif to identify somebody. And that takes 10 months to give the identification of an IP address used in uh, organized crime cases. Sorry, people, this is not OK. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, I also have to thank like all of our panelists for their really different perspectives. Now I w just want to go right into the discussion because we have only 10 minutes left and I hand over to Diego who will lead the discussion. Um, thank you. Uh, well, I just want to uh, uh, add a couple of comments before giving you the floor. Well, the issue of national security as, uh, as an exclusive competence has to be mentioned. Uh, well, also the, the Commission needs to know that well, they are aware that they are the guardian of the treaties. 
And uh, in order to uh, enforce restriction of fundamental rights, well, they need to be, uh, they need to be ne necessary and proportionate. So they, they have the role of, uh, of solving that. And on the issue of the collaboration of companies with law enforcement, um, I think it's not an issue of collaboration, but uh, an issue of uh, uh, getting warrants on a case-by-case -case basis, balancing all fundamental rights. It's true that privacy is not the highest one. There are no ranking of, of human rights. They are all equal at the same time. So that needs to be balanced, but I want to give you really the floor, and so please raise your hand. Yes, uh, Tobias Morsches from Datenschutzraum Germany. Um, I wanted first to say I see it the other way around than you. I say uh, accessing in uh, a specific case is okay, but the uh, bulk storage of all data is an issue because uh, if you look at the um, worldwide situation, we have uh, it is impossible at the moment to secure the data properly, and we are in a take all uh, policy. That means the secret services take everything they get. They infiltrate uh, providers. They infiltrate uh, governments. Uh, the criminal organizations, the big ones, they take uh, data from whatever uh, company they want. So how uh, can that be secured? And the second question, uh, short, how can it be uh, proportionate to collect data of everyone and not being able to see uh, what is being done? And one last point, you said you have bulletproof uh, uh uh, proof that everything is uh, that you have uh, this data. Um, this data is not proof at all because this data does not say someone has committed something. This data just says uh, the IP was uh, assigned to someone. You don't know if it was the person himself. You don't even know if it was used uh, from uh, his computer or if someone else has infiltrated the computer and relayed. I investigate uh, such cases, and in many cases we find out there was a uh, virus that has been installed and they used the computer as a relay and you don't find out who is the computer behind. So that's my question. Yeah, you want to make mm, the answer? You're from Germany, <coughs> I drive a German car. What is one of the most good things of a German car? If you push down the throttle, you can drive very fast. There is one privacy issue with my car that is that they have attached a license plate to my car. And there is a government that is collecting all of the data of all the innocent Belgian people driving around with not only German cars, but also French cars. They are less quality. But, but nobody says, why should we collect the data of all people driving around while only Mr. Valinta, the judge, drives faster than 120 on the highway with his German car. Because we say, oh, no, 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 we collect them because sometimes ac severe accidents happen and we want to know who was behind the car, be behind the steering wheel. Just like with an IP address. Do we know for certain that it is the owner of the car? No. But at least we can ask politely the question, who was driving your car? Bank records. If I bought in Brussels, people from other countries, Brussels is a nice town, not always as beautiful as we would like to, to be, but if you buy something from a chocolatier and you buy a present for your wife and you pay it with your uh, pass, pin pass, uh, and you buy a next present for your mistress, <coughs> the same moment, that information is going to be kept by bank for more than 10 years. And nobody, nobody says, nobody goes to the constitutional court, says, oh, we do not like banking, and we do not like them keeping all our records. But in serious fraud uh, affairs, we use that information to solve cases. So I, I do not really see the problem. And you have, you have a very important point that was made that is secret services, uh, hackers, um, and I have to say 
I do not know how to protect. But I already saw that in some of the other rooms, there is the creme de la creme of people who are able to offer solutions for a very bulletproof protection. So I cannot say to you that I am able to say from which person, from which region, <coughs> or from which little time lap, I need data. Because tomorrow, somebody will disappear. One of the first uh, examples I gave, uh, uh, a little girl disappeared. Uh, and the only contacts we have is a Facebook account and some contacts with a guy who said he was a, a photographer and he would be able to give her a job uh, in, in Vanity Fair or uh, I don't know where. And that's the information we need to solve cases. Should you, should the parliament, should the people say, okay, let's put aside data retention, we do not agree upon it, but then I want it to be a, a very, uh, how do you call it, fair political discussion, because then you would have to accept that such cases we will not be able to solve anymore. And that is often an issue. And I remember Professor Gerke saying, ah, but we have to agree that you would not be able to solve cases anymore, some of those cases. If that is a political point of view, you will, the people, parliament is able to say so. But in my country, uh, little girls disappearing is still one of the traumas we live with. And I am, I'm very sorry, confronted every week with the case of somebody disappearing, of leaving traces on Facebook, Gmail. So I, I, I do not agree. I do not see the solution in not keeping the data of everybody. And the fact that you see you say you also keep data of innocent people, I am very, very aware of that. But I am also very aware that sometimes innocent people today are my next murderer in the next case tomorrow. So I do not know on upfront. I am not Tom Cruise in the Minority Report who is able to, to see who is committing a crime. So I would invite all those professors sitting upstairs and who are like uh, the experts in all what is encryption to offer us a solution that we will be able to, to keep data. For me, one year is already maybe long enough. Um, but then again, we have prescription rules in Belgium. If you are uh, a child who is raped, for example, by your father or your stepfather, um, prescription, that means the time in which you can go to court, only commences the moment you are 18 years old. If you are raped, a woman that is raped, we, s we had a recent case with a very known Belgian polit politician, you can wait for three years to go to court. And nobody will say, ah, you were raped, you waited for three years, we will not take this case. In such cases, and in this particular case, I think, we are often confronted with a suspect that says, I do not know that girl, I do not know that woman. And it is thanks to sometimes communication that we can prove, sir, what you are saying is not correct. If you do not know that, that girl, that uh, woman, how come that you texted her all night long <coughs> for a certain period. So those cases only start with data retention and also are only solvable with data retention. So if you would say, no, not going to do those cases anymore, you have to come directly yeah, because when you uh, refer to other means, uh, Germany with very short data retention periods for the moment, you can always say quick freeze. I ask a country to quick freeze the data of somebody. But then you already know which person that is involved and you do not know all the other persons that <coughs> may be attached. So I agree that we disagree. Um, but I invite you, and that's, and that's one of the, 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 the major problems I had when we were like uh, helping out with rewriting our data retention legislation where we had a positive uh, advice from our own privacy commission and they are trustworthy in the sense that they they didn't okay the first time 
I have the impression that some of the people came to Belgium as like going to a swimming pool and they didn't even look around. But afterwards they said, we didn't see a, 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 a lifeguard, we didn't say, see uh, safety issues put in place, and actually we, we all had that in Belgium. So that's, for me, it's very frustrating. Uh, if you misuse the data, you are punishable up to five years of imprisonment. Who can access the data? Only a judge, only a judge. Uh, data that is only identification, it's a public prosecutor. But all the data uh, that is traffic is, is somebody else. We might sorry. want to have the, uh, another question. Maybe we have the of time course. for that. Oh sorry to interrupt. Oh. Yeah, In one minute. So one quick question from someone from the floor. In the meantime, uh, I think the, the comparison with the license plates is not very good because, for example, I have my bike registered before the Belgian authorities. And that's okay in case uh, it is stolen. But I hope you cannot check where I go with my bike, uh, what I have in my saddlebags, who am I carrying sometimes uh, with me on my, on my bike. So that's uh, in, the, in the comparison with the uh, web browsing with all the electronic communications. That's, but not, that's not true because we're not, we're not looking for content. I do not want to know what is in the bags of your bike. I only want to know which person contacted which person and under which uh, uh, pillar of, of communication. Yeah. Uh? yeah, but you can check uh, with a warrant who is the uh, owner of the IP address. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. you can have it. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Christian Malis from the Technological Research Institute, BICOM in uh, France. Uh, it's more of a finishing comment, I think, for Monsieur Van uh, Linutou regarding data retention. Uh, three points. Firstly, as we have said, the security of the data. I'm still wondering if every entity who are obliged to retain data can actually ensure its safety, but we've already addressed that question, so I'll let it pass. Second concerning who can actually access the data. I agree to a certain degree that it could be that it's proper use for judges to be able to access data, because obviously we want the legal system and the judicial system to function. But, and it seems to me, as you have pointed out, that in Belgium only judges have the access to data. That is not the case everywhere. Um, and I think that sort of abuse poses a very great risk in, re in terms of data retention. Uh, I live in France, and we have recently seen um, sort of a wave of changes in how we uh, treat the judicial system, uh, both in terms of access to data, that is one point, but secondly, concerning the fact that you want to have access to data, you say, as a judge. Uh, the issue in, in France is that sometimes France has decided that you are not needed mm -hmm. because they deal with administrative blocking of websites to deal with administrative uh, police raids into people's houses during this state of emergency, l'état d'urgence. Mm -hmm. And now France is moving towards making these sort of measures permanent, and which means that in, de in that case, your, you as a judge, as a judicial judge, will be completely excluded from the legal pro process. Mm -hmm. And France is moving towards saying that um, in sorry, the please, your question very, very short. Yeah, sorry. In, a in a digital society, we need smarter and faster solutions where the judicial judge will basically be, be excluded. So I'd like to have your opinion, your comment on that, please. Uh, was it a question or only a comment? Finishing, finishing comment, but I would like to have okay. your opinion too on, on the exclusion of the judicial judge in the process of... Mm. of I'm a fan of the guide, so uh, thank you very much, sir, by pointing out how important a judge is in the role of... Um, watching over data retention. And the story is, an, is not an or, or story, it's an and, and story. You need law enforcement to be able to solve cases because otherwise we will live in a society where bad things can happen and we do, we do not have the, uh, the opportunity to fight back. Yeah? Crim organized crime, <coughs> uh, people using means that are freely available on the internet. Uh, but I do agree, and that's w another struggle I am still fighting, that is that you need judges to control. You have police, you have public prosecutor's office, everybody has his own tasks, but for certain privacy invasive measures, you need a judge to okay. And that's the, the, the reason why I think in my country, the investigating judge is a well-placed person because I, I'm not married to the police, I'm not married to the public prosecutor's office, and sometimes I say no. And in France, you had the juge d'instruction, uh, after uh, uh, L'Affaire Outreux, uh, it was put aside, now you have... But we, we, we see some countries where the public prosecutor's office has more contact with politicians and more contact with 
governments and where they try to have more power. And that's not a good, a good idea. So I agree with you. If you agree with me that we need the data and it's, it's, it's a danger to store it somewhere not protected and that you have a danger that somebody would be able to look into it for not urgent matters or not for, for finding truth, I agree with you. But you can solve that by putting in place a uh, control mechanism by a judge. Uh, thanks very much. Maybe Anna, final words or uh, are we done? I just want to thank all the panelists and I think you can also ask the panelists if you see them on the conference. I think you will all be here for a longer time to conclude, I think, a very interesting discussion. Okay, thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you.